Now let's go on to the next topic of treatment of carcinoid syndrome and treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. So I'll come to you, uh, Dr. Morrison. We kind of talked about this before. How do you get the patients to manage their expectations? Like, what you know, how do you say this is how it's kind of going to be? It's a long haul. How do you get them to manage the expectations? Talk about the side effects. Do you talk about them in the front? That this is what you know may happen. Yeah. We try to explain what types of therapies are out there, what the different options are for their particular cancer. Uh, some people, the different therapies may be applicable to them at different points in the disease. And then, again, our emphasis is on using the therapies that are going to be effective, but hopefully not cause undue toxicities or risks or side effects. We always start with somatostatin analogs. They uh, both control the symptoms, and we know now, of course, that they control the rate of growth of these tumors as well. And many people, that's all they need for months or years. A time eventually comes when there is progression. If the disease is limited to the liver, for example, we'll often use what are called local regional therapies. Uh, those are done by interventional radiologists, typically with catheters. They uh, will go into an artery in the leg and uh, direct the catheter up into an artery in the liver and try to identify the blood supply to the tumor. And they can deliver particles that block off the blood vessels so the tumor starves for blood. Uh, you can also inject particles that have uh, chemotherapy embedded in them and particles that have radioactivity, usually an element called Y90 embedded in them. And for many people, those will also help the symptoms because they reduce the bulk of the tumor. In fact, you've had that done several times. I have. In fact, I had one just recently, about three weeks ago. Ah. And the idea was to cut off the blood supply to certain areas of the tumor so that the tumor there would die. And if it's dead, it can't produce serotonin. So the symptoms can get better. And you're obviously shrinking the tumor, or at least controlling its growth, so there isn't as much progression of disease. In people that have tumor outside the liver or where those uh, local regional therapies aren't working or can't be done for technical reasons, then we have other systemic therapies. The next one we typically go to is a drug called Everolimus, or a trade name would be Affinitor. It's an oral agent. It's taken every day. Some people, my patients sometimes will say, was well, that chemotherapy? And technically, it's not chemotherapy the way we think of chemotherapy that Classic just indiscriminately of kills right. cells. But it, but it is a targeted therapy. It interrupts a pathway that's important in neuroendocrine tumors. And people, again, can take that for a period of time. will have control over the growth of the tumor, sometimes some minor shrinkage as well. And uh, if, if that's no longer uh, controlling the disease anymore, that's sometimes when we do think about the chemotherapy or we go back to uh, using the embolizations, the local regional therapies again. Uh, on the horizon, uh, we're very excited uh, about the possibility that a radioactive drug given intravenously will become FDA approved in the next year. It's called lutetium 177 Why don't dotatate. Why do complicated names? I, All these I, drugs I, with this I disease agree. have complicated names. I, I agree. Radikinin, um, you know, is like the hormone which is produced. Yeah, All the treatments seem to be also complicated. Uh, it, gives, it gives me something to sound <laughs> brilliant about, I guess, because uh, I can pronounce that name. But it's a, it's a drug that has some similarities to octreotide, so it binds to the receptors on the outside of neuroendocrine cells. But it is uh, attached to a molecule that binds a radioactive drug called lutetium-177. When lutetium-177 undergoes its normal uh, breakdown, it releases energy that can kill cancer cells. And this drug has been extensively used in Europe for a number of years. Indeed, I have some patients who have traveled there to get it. It was uh, tested in a pivotal trial and is uh, hopefully to be FDA approved in the next year. So it'll be available for people that have had growth of the tumor after taking the somatostatin analogs. That's great. So exciting times ahead, uh, truly in this, uh, in this kind of rare disease. So that's, uh, that's amazing right. to know. Tell me about somatostatin analogs. What are they? Are they a shot? Is it a IV? Is it a pill? The currently available forms of somatostatin analogs are given by injection. There are uh, two that are given. One is given intramuscular, the, that's octreotide, long-acting, and then there's one that's given subcutaneously, that's lanreotide. For people who have episodes of breakthrough where they need an extra dose, there's a short-acting that can be given subcutaneously by a person themselves. 
So is the goal, let's say, uh, you have liver lesions, is the goal to stabilize the disease, shrink the tumors? W what is the goal? Decrease the s uh, symptoms of carcinoid syndrome? What is the goal of these uh, treatments that you talked about? The currently available forms of somatostatin analogs are given by injection. There are uh, two that are given. One is given intramuscular, the, that's octreotide, long-acting, and then there's one that's given subcutaneously, that's lanreotide. For people who have episodes of breakthrough where they need an extra dose, there's a short acting that can be given subcutaneously by a person themselves. So is the goal, let's say, uh, you have liver lesions. Is the goal to stabilize the disease, shrink the tumors? W what is the goal? Decrease the uh, symptoms of carcinoid syndrome? What is the goal of these uh, treatments that you talked about? Some of these concepts of how to treat have evolved in just the last few years. Initially, it was really symptom management. If you could control the diarrhea and the flushing, people could live many years, even if the disease happened to progress. Uh, it was really the symptoms that were, in some cases, so debilitating or even lethal that we really needed to do something about that. When the somatostatin analogs came along and controlled the symptoms quite well initially, that allowed many people to live long enough where then the aspect of the tumor growth became more of a concern. Interestingly, along the way, it became clear that people were living longer if they were receiving these therapies. And that actually led to clinical trials to specifically answer that question, is, is there anti-cancer activity for somatostatin analogs? And now we know there, there is. So fortunately, we can give a therapy that controls symptoms and also slows down the growth of the tumor. Um, shrinkage is not that common, but stability for a prolonged period of time is. Now tell me about surgery. Now Larry had talked about, I was not a surgical candidate. Uh, is it sometimes that people are surgical candidates? Does surgery have a role? Does radiation have a role? We always ask the surgical question. First of all, people often still have their primary tumor in place. Amazingly, you can have a very small primary tumor that's asymptomatic and have substantial metastatic disease in the liver. However, some people eventually do get symptoms from their primary tumor by causing bowel obstruction. In those situations, people do need surgery. Uh, there's also uh, certainly people that only have the disease in the bowel. If it happens to be identified that early, of course, we want to try to resect it as well. Over the years, trying to deal with the liver metastasis or perhaps other metastatic sites of, of spread so of the, the disease. So the way it's been spread, liver growth, of tumor which went from the small bowel to the liver. Correct. So those tumors now, we feel that if we can remove 90% of the disease, that we are effectively setting the clock back. That is, to get to the bulk of tumor that they have prior to surgery could take years. So if, if we can achieve that, um, in some cases even 70% would be sufficient to uh, suggest surgery is worth doing. But in, in this probably would be in highly selected cases. A absolutely. A and we have multidisciplinary clinics. I sit right next to a, a liver surgeon, so every case I can discuss with him and ask those questions. Is it appropriate to do liver surgery in that particular individual? So what is a, what is multidisciplinary clinic? What is it? Just so that our uh, you know audience understands that this is a relatively new concept. Probably was not there a decade back. It's probably become more in the last decade. One of the important things about a cancer like this is it is managed by different specialists. The medical oncologist typically is the person who's uh, captain of the ship, like a quarterback, a quarterback, quarterback. T typically, but. Uh, there's a role for surgery in many people, interventional radiology to uh, treat lesions in the liver using uh, catheter-based therapies. It's uncommon to use radiation therapy, but there are scenarios where it's useful. If somebody has a spread to the bone, for example, they might have it. Uh, and then there are a lot of other ancillary staff as well, nutritionists, for example, and patient support, psychologists, and our nurse practitioners the treatment room nurses. So there are a lot of people involved in managing a case of somebody that has neuroendocrine tumor. So when we talk about multidiscipline, we're, we're trying to bring in many different specialists to discuss a person's case. In the ideal, of course, it would be everybody can <laughs> congregate and discuss that person right then. The reality is, of course, in large medical centers, we sometimes are in different places at different times, but we can still discuss the person either at a conference a separate conference or just uh, by picking up the phone or by paging. But the, the nice thing is that I don't have to wonder, 
is surgery going to be possible? I can just ask that question. And so I think it's more important to think about the mindset of multidisciplinary and how you carry it out in your institution that's, you know. So Larry, does that make you feel special? Like there was a whole team behind you? Well, actually it does. And it's, it's the reason that I would encourage anyone who's faced with what I was faced with to seek treatment from a place like Duke, a place where, and this is not meant to be a commercial for Duke. <laughs> yeah, we, not commercial. We're, 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 I appreciate it. Though. But, <laughs> but the point is to, to seek treatment where people deal with this. With a rare the tumor, time. kind of the syndromes and everything. Because yeah. my experience has been in the past six years that many physicians knew about as much as I did about neuroendocrine tumors. You're as educated. I, I hate to say that, <laughs> but uh, it's true. It's true. And yet, one thing I want to just make sure we point out is uh, while it is important to get opinions at specialty centers that can bring in the multiple disciplines. Uh, we obviously work with people's local physicians. There are many fine local oncologists who can uh, see people on a regular basis while they're getting their standard somatostatin analogs or some of the other therapies. And then if there are decision points, that's another time that we get involved. Some people do have the good fortune to be nearby and can see us on a regular basis. But for those who aren't, it's perfectly fine to have care locally as long as they know that from time to time, if necessary, can come back to, the can, can come mm -hmm. back to a, you know, a medical center that can uh, help with the next step.